quality higher education symbolized through elite higher educational institutions is conventionally considered as an antidote to historical social inequalities like caste or race divides. Simultaneously, these educational institutes reproduce newer forms of caste ex exclusion, often couched in the language of merit. This talk will address the question of social justice with respect to India's higher educational institute towards making inclusive spaces for justice and diversity in higher education. I welcome Professor Sadish Deshpande to deliver this lecture. And participants, please mute your mics and turn off your videos for the smooth conduction of this program. So you can start your. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm assuming about 35 to 40 minutes. Yeah, sure, sir. Okay. Uh, you can uh, talk and we'll take the question after after the lecture. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's get started. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, in a strange way, uh, the pandemic has also provided opportunity uh, for a lot more uh, meetings of this sort. Uh, than used to happen before because they don't actually involve travel, uh, which was uh, much more difficult to organize. Uh, so I'm happy to be here, uh, you know, uh, here in the in the um, electronic sense, uh, and um, look forward to the uh, discussion. So the basic theme is simple enough. Uh, higher education, in particular, apart from the other uh, kinds of cures that were suggested for the long-standing disease of inequality in society. Uh, higher education in... <coughs> I'm sorry, I have this cough, so I'll um, keep interrupting myself. Um, higher education in particular has been considered a very desirable, uh, among the most desirable cures for, um, for inequality. Um, historically, massive social mobility, that is to say, a, a period of history, a short, relatively short period of history, where inequalities in a society get drastically reduced, um, have happened for two broad reasons. One is a relatively, historically relatively rare event, and that is a prolonged uh, boom, economic boom that lasts for decades, more than one decade. And therefore, as a, um, as a kind of rising tide, it lifts all boats and it also uh, tends to reduce inequality. In the Western world, uh, we had this happen after the end of the Second World War and into the 1970s or so. So from the end of the 1940s or the beginning of 1950s till about the middle of the 1970s until, say, the what is called the oil shock, the first uh, OPEC formation of OPEC and the petroleum shock. Uh, until then, um, there was this unbroken, historically unprecedented, unbroken uh, stretch of economic prosperity. Broadly speaking, there were there were minor hiccups along the way and so on. And this lifted levels of consumption across Western Europe and North America and the developed world as we know it. Other than that, the only other major uh, way in which social inequalities have got reduced drastically in a short period has been essentially through revolutions, revolutions of different sorts, but basically involving a radical redistribution of resources from one segment of the population to another. Uh, and essentially the expropriation of resources uh, from the uh, from those who, who had a near monopoly on them and their redistribution. Uh, the, so other than these two routes, the one route, the one route of uh, long-term uh, booms is no longer within national control. In, in the globalized uh, world, uh, a single country cannot really, other than accidentally, hope to have this kind of a long period of growth. Uh, revolutions are, as you know, 
considered an outdated idea in many parts of the world and uh, are not on the cards for, they are not in the in, they, are, they are not written in the future of most countries uh, so these routes are not available and if these are not available then what are the routes other options for uh, reducing high levels of inequality especially in countries like india with a large population and la a very high levels of absolute poverty uh, as well as um, inequality uh, obviously inequality is has long been recognized to be a source of social unrest and uh, power structures and states have always tried to control it in some way and from this point of view higher education offers a so to speak peaceful reformist option for uh, reducing social inequalities uh, and therefore <coughs> and therefore there has been in the modern era a lot of hope associated with higher education so in short just to cut a very long story short and this is probably some of you are familiar with this uh, in a sense the birth of uh, higher education in the in the modern sense higher education as a form of credentialing uh, which is very very recent it only dates from the late 19 the last quarter of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century we have the emergence of this we have the emergence of technology on a mass scale uh, technology that is no longer contained in guild like formations more or less sealed off formations of skilled knowledge but is um, in a sense uh, democratized to some extent and turned into sciences that can be studied uh, into fields of study so it's only from this period it's only essentially from the last quarter of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century that we have the emergence of what is what has been called the credential society where uh, technical education expanded on a mass scale and certification of technical skills uh, began on a mass scale and the whole like bureaucratic apparatus for this was developed in the western world uh, rudiments of it existed in different form in say the chinese examination system and so on but in it in the form that we recognize uh, today including uh, the great institution of the examination the competitive public examination and the um rankings of individuals according to performance in an examination that where that examination certifies certain kind of uh, technical competence this is a relatively recent phenomenon and this promised a certain kind of democrat democratization and the end of uh, you know what used to be called uh, the, the aristocracy by birth and the transition to the aristocracy of talent so so far very deliberately i have made no mention of caste this is a broad story of the expectations that were associated with higher education in relation to social inequality generally not only in countries like india not only in relation to um institutions like caste but uh, broadly more broadly so these expectations that higher education will help to reduce inequalities and will be, become a vehicle for large scale and significant um, levels of uh, social mobility have in recent times been belied they have been um, contradicted by the experience of many many countries across the globe the 21st century has seen a truly remarkable expansion of higher education across the world not just uh, in 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 countries like uh, india and china this has happened in a truly spectacular fashion uh, in fact what has happened in china and india in the last 30 years or so uh, has no parallel in human history such large numbers have not entered higher education uh, in such a short period in no other period in human history uh just china and india alone if you take and uh 
The same process has also been followed in what are called middle income countries and also even in um, developed countries like the OECD countries. Let me quickly give you some figures on this. <coughs> um, the OECD average, uh, the gross enrollment ratio, which is uh, the proportion of, uh, of the relevant age group, that is the age group that is considered suitable for a particular level of education. Higher education is usually uh, considered 18 to 23, uh, but these, these standards can vary. So there, there is a lot of uh, minor variation in terms of statistical definitions and so on. But broadly speaking, uh, in OECD countries in 2000, the uh, gross enrollment ratio for higher education was something like 26%, and it rose to 43% in 2016 uh, in 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 um, china in we don't chinese statistics are uh, notoriously uh, difficult to interpret and so on but still uh, in 1998 this is according to the china human development report of 2016 in 1998 the gross enrollment ratio in higher education for china was 9.8 percent and by 2014 it had risen to 37.5 percent uh, and the Indian story, of course, you know, uh, we have gone and we have had a spectacular uh, increase in our uh, gross enrollment ratio, which has doubled between, roughly doubled, from 13.8% to 26, more than 26, 27%. In fact, the most recent figures, the government claims 28, 29% um, gross enroll enrollment ratio. So um, there has been this massive expansion of higher education. And in relation to what I was saying earlier, in terms of what was expected from uh, higher education in terms of its impact on social inequalities, uh, this should have been very good news, particularly in countries like India. Uh, but unfortunately, not only in India, but also in um, the rest of the world where, where this massive, what is called the massification of higher education has happened, uh, the impact on inequality has not been what was expected. In fact, it has been quite disappointing. And broadly speaking, researchers are by being led to uh, conclude that um, in the massification phase, higher education no longer uh, is a vehicle for reducing inequality, but in fact, um, strengthens or uh, if not strengthens, at least um, does not adversely impact, does not reduce uh, existing types of inequality. Uh, there have been some, the causes for this have been, uh, several causes have been identified for this. Uh, just let me run very quickly through them. One is uh, that massification has almost always been achieved at the level of wide, at the cost of wide variation in quality. So you can have uh, the massification of uh, higher education uh, only if you permit institutions of widely varying quality levels to come up. And therefore, this opens the door for older elites to corner the higher quality institutions. And therefore, within a broader context of the expansion of higher education, the better quality higher education can continue to be cornered by the old elites. And therefore, inequality need not go down. Um, the other explanation, of course, uh, this is an old one, is the very strong role of social capital as a complementary factor. It is not by credentials alone that uh, social mobility is achieved. It is credentials plus social capital of various kinds. And the distribution of that social capital is not changed when uh, access to higher education is broadened. Therefore, uh, the existence of inequalities of social capital continue to produce inequality of educational outcomes, uh, despite the massification of, um, of uh, higher education. Finally, and this is probably the biggest uh, reason uh, and something that will concern us and that I think we, we need to come back to this um, repeatedly uh, while we are talking about this theme, uh, the final and perhaps the broadest reason is 
the change in the character of capitalism uh, since now there effectively isn't any i mean other than china which is a peculiar case um, there isn't any effective uh, alternative or a different mode of organizing uh, economy uh, we are in a in a unquestionably capitalist era and the most recent phase of this what has been called neoliberalism and although it is now said that we may be entering a post neoliberal era but um, the neoliberal era has seen uh, not only on the one hand um, a shrinking of state support for higher education and therefore increasing levels of privatization which in turn has almost always in every context uh, driven up the cost of higher education and therefore allowed older inequalities uh, to to continue to um, be dominant despite the uh, broadening of access to higher education uh, the other larger issue associated with this form and this um, uh, this avatar of capitalism is the disconnect between growth and jobs so as many of you may be aware uh, this phase of capitalist growth has also been called jobless growth uh, it has accompanied the financialization of the world economy uh, so that we can have uh, a large scale optical illusion of uh, high growth rates and um, uh, these kinds of statistical mirages where so-called wealth is growing, but uh, jobs are not growing. So that ways in which people who already don't already possess wealth, the ways in which they can increase their wealth, this phrase wealth creation, which has become a favorite phrase of this era, uh, is um, treated as though it's available to all. Uh, but in fact, uh, it is not. And uh, therefore, um, the massification of higher education um, has um, because higher education by itself as as should be obvious cannot bring about social mobility it's when the higher educational credentials that you have acquired can be encashed in society that is when society provides returns for those credentials that's when you will experience social mobility as somebody who only has credential capital and not much of social capital so when um, the economy is not linking jobs to growth so you can have uh, uh, financialized uh, growth rates uh, which have very little implication for jobs and therefore produce no equalizing effect or no social mobility effect so in other words uh, the link the hopeful link the the uh, idealistic link between higher education and um, the le lessening of inequalities seems to have been um, broken fairly decisively in the last two decades. OK, so this is the background of the, this is the larger story. Even without ever mentioning caste, uh, this would be true. This, this broad story of a growing disillusionment with the uh, progressive uh, role of progressive in the sense of re reducing social inequality, the role of higher education uh, is, is the backdrop to this. Now let's uh, bring back caste. <coughs> um, much of this will be familiar to uh, all of you, so I won't spend too much time. Um, as, as you all know, caste, the, the distinctive thing about caste is that, like so many other forms of inequality, uh, in fact, like the very idea of inequality itself, uh, is it, it is a relational idea. Uh, and caste in particular, like, uh, like race um, uh, often is, uh, is deeply relational. So um, what matters uh, in, in, in a caste, uh, in, in a so society that is um, saturated with caste, what matters is relative distance. People tend to be sensitive, groups tend to be sensitive, not so much to absolute levels of prosperity or status, economic status, but they seem to, they seem to be very, very sensitive to uh, changes in social distance. That is, 
changes in the sort of hierarchical gap that exists between one group and another. And most dominant groups, especially when they don't see a bright future for themselves, are very deeply invested in this relative distance. So anything that is perceived as the other group lessening the distance uh, between the dominant group and the, uh, and, and between, and suppose I am the dominant group, then the moment I see that uh, the gap between me and you, who I consider to be inferior to me, and therefore you should be at a certain, a certain distance below me, broadly speaking, if you begin to close that distance, then I get very agitated because my self-identity is in large part invested in that distance. So my sense of who I am depends a lot on my being able to say that I am better than or I'm superior to X, Y, Z uh, group and so on. So this is a um, uh, fundamental aspect um, of, of, of caste. Uh, and um, our, our, the story of our country's engagement with this institution is a uh, eventful story. And uh, just to summarize a very, very quickly the post-independence features of this, the new constitution and new republic brought uh, in ways that we don't fully understand yet, or we have just begun to understand, uh, brought contradictory forces into play. On the one hand, of course, as is well known, and uh, this part of the story is uh, emphasized a lot, um, the constitution derecognized caste in, in an official sense, in a de jure sense. Uh, it made all Indians equal, plus it brought the important feature of, uh, for short, let's call it reservation. That is, uh, despite, in, even in a constitution that was um, founded on the idea of the equality of all citizens, space was found to build in uh, programs that gave special recognition to the historical exploitation and discrimination that large groups in our society had been subjected to. So reservation was part, was a pre-constitutional, actually the idea of reservation precedes uh, and the practice of reservation precedes uh, the writing of the con uh, con uh, constitution. Um, and the idea of equality, of course, is also older than that. So both these are, in a sense, founding ideas in, in, in the Constitution. But this has a peculiar effect because it allows one side of the story to continue to take advantage of caste, uh, of caste privileges, uh, while at the same time insisting that they are casteless. And on the other hand, it forces a different section of society to always emphasize their caste identity in order to claim social justice. So reservation is, is, a, is a good example of that. You can claim reservation only by declaring your caste. Whereas the advantages of being upper caste, many of those advantages become in this new uh, dispensation, they become, uh, so to speak, secular advantages. And you can claim both uh, to continue to enjoy those advantages, as well as you can claim the right to be anonymous in caste terms. That is, you can claim to be casteless. Now, this peculiar combination has done, done things to a society that we are trying to understand. Within this, let's try and understand where we are with regard to higher education and, um, and, and uh, caste inequality. Uh, the basic points I'm making is that we are perhaps at a new turning point in the history of this story. The story of how the Constitution and uh, its dispensation was used to bring about social justice through reservation, particularly in higher education. Uh, in recent times, we seem to be now reaching the end of the road as far as simple access based on reservation is concerned for particularly for elite education elite education has for long remained immune to even to to the normal reservation rules but from the 90s onwards various elite institutions 
uh, have also been brought under the purvey of, of uh, reservation. So uh, that has been, there still is a long way to go. And there are, as, as I'm sure many of you are aware, there are many hurdles still. But uh, in, in pure statistical terms or in, in terms of pure formal access, much of what could be got from this current dispensation or the current um, social system has already been got. That's one point. The other point is what we already said, the breakdown of the expected link between higher education and the reduction of social mobility in the context of a uh, neoliberal capitalist uh, economy, which uh, has broken the link between growth and um, and, and, <coughs> and and jobs. So I just want to quickly show you uh, some, um, I'm going to be presenting now just to Just one second. Can you see this table? No, sir. No, I can see it. Uh, I have it full screen here. So it should yeah, be. Yeah. You? Yeah, yes, I said, said, yeah. Yes. Can you read it? Yes. 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 Uh, uh, yes, yes. So this is the gross enrollment ratio for various social groups. This is just uh, the simplest data. Uh, so, you can see now. Yes. Uh, so essentially, the, look at the 2018-19 column, uh, and. Uh, the first, uh, the gross enrollment ratio for scheduled tribes and scheduled castes, uh, you can see is increasing. It has increased substantially from 2010-11. Yes, yes, yes. And in terms of the last column, uh, the 2018 na last column expresses the GER for each group as a percentage of the national average. So. Scheduled tribes have, are about two thirds of the national average, and uh, scheduled castes have come much higher. They are 88% of the national average in terms of GER. Uh, this is a slightly more detailed breakup uh, with uh, percentage share in total university enrollment. This is a different way of doing the calculation than the GER. The GER is the is a relatively crude uh, statistic. This is somewhat more uh, refined. So uh, we know that the last column shows you the share of that group in the population, roughly the, its share in the population. And the second last column, the 2018-19 column, shows you their share in university enrollment. So the basically, the point I'm trying to make is that between 2010 and 11, uh, we have made significant uh, progress towards reaching. There's still a gap, like scheduled tribes. We still see a gap between their um, representation in the general population and their representation in higher education or in universities, more more accurately. Uh, <coughs> but for all groups, it's been rising. And if you look at the bottom row, this is a residual row. It is calculated. There's no, no official source of statistic for this, but I have calculated this by subtracting the other groups uh, in the relevant data sets. Uh, has been shrinking. It's, it's relative monopoly over uh, university education. It used to be uh, upwards of 70% uh, earlier in earlier decades. Uh, has come down to little over one third. Uh, but the most important table I want to show you is the next one. Uh, I'm sorry, it's very crowded, but uh, I've marked in red. The, the red uh, numbers are 1918-19, uh, sorry, 2018-19 for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. 
This is uh, the All India Survey of Higher Education data. This is the latest data that we have for 2018-19. Uh, and it shows you the percentage, the the percentage share in enrollment in different types of higher educational institutions. Remember, we were saying that massification is often achieved uh, through very varying quality, um, and therefore we need to pay attention to a disaggregated picture and not simply talk about higher education as though it were a homogeneous single field. So that's the point of this table. And this is from the All India Survey of Higher Education, which also, like all data sources, it also has its limitations. But this is, roughly speaking, this is the best data we have on higher education at the, at, at the moment. Uh, and you will see that uh, if you take uh, the, the constitutional reservation of 15.5% for scheduled castes as, um, as, as a benchmark, then uh, Compare these numbers to 15 and compare the scheduled tribe numbers to, uh, let's say, 8%. And you will see that <coughs> <coughs> while there is still uh, some gap, uh, it's not a humongous gap. And if you look at the last column, it shows you by what proportion the share of upper caste Hindus has been coming down in different uh, types of institutions. So we can argue about the exact interpretation of this and how much gap remains in different kinds of institutions, what matters and so on. Uh, but um, the broad point I want to make is that there is not much more room left. Um, we can come back to this in case you have uh, questions uh, about this. Uh, I'm going to uh, stop sharing now. Uh, yes. Okay, so if we have reached the end or we are close to the end of uh, formal access via reservation, especially in higher education, and if the massification or broader access to higher education has broken the link, expected link between social mobility and this, what do we do? Uh, this is really the question to which I don't really have answers and which I would like us to discuss more. Um, I have some some thoughts on this to uh, to share with you, and then uh, I, we can go on to a um, to a discussion. So, um, what is to be done today is, I think, one of the most important things to do today. Uh, as different from, say, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, is to focus on the so-called more softer forms of exclusion. Simply not allowing someone to enter an institution is a hard form of exclusion. Softer forms of exclusion are when you permit access, but you have other mechanisms, mecha informal mechanisms, mechanisms that are not defined uh, uh, and, and therefore are much harder to fight. Uh, you have much subtler social mechanisms of creating in-groups and out-groups. And therefore, despite their formal inclusion through law, you ensure that the new entrant groups cannot fully participate in the higher educational institution through various mechanisms that you have. Uh, and we need to address this issue quite centrally as, as uh, this has to come up um, very high on our agendas. Uh, the battle before was to get formal inclusion because formal inclusion itself was being denied. Now we have formal inclusion and we need to move to the, um, move to the next step. Uh, I mentioned this because caste issues are, as, as we all know, um, saturated with ideology in, in our country. And one of the most powerful ideologies with which caste politics has been pursued is the ideology of castelessness. It's the ideological position that says, I am beyond caste. Why are you continually wanting to talk about caste and dragging us backwards? We should be moving forward where we don't, we are not interested in anyone's caste. 
uh, this sounds like, and, and um, by the way, this is something that um, not so long ago, uh, I myself believed. Uh, and, and I felt that I was also casteless and so on. Uh, this is very important because institutions like reservation have been undermined ideologically, despite the formal access that they that they provide. They have they have uh, they have been positioned in such a way that they prevent full participation by those who uh, avail of reservation uh, through ideological means, through the construction of reservation as a kind of great um, travesty, a great a violation of uh, what otherwise is assumed to be the norm, the norm of meritocracy. Uh, now, uh, we have reached a stage where this ideology is beginning to see cracks. For a long time, this had, this was mirror smooth. And, and, and you, it was very difficult to break through this ideology. Now it's beginning to break through, we are beginning to break through this, especially since the 90s. This process has started since the 90s, in the Mandal era, so to speak. <coughs> I just want to speak about a few things. Uh, when I, it's it's very abstract when you talk about, you know, the ideological saturation of reservation and so on, uh, and this can be very abstract sounding. So I want to give you a few concrete examples. Uh, one concrete example I want to give you is from my own university, which is Delhi University. Some years ago, I think uh, 2015 or uh, maybe 2016. Uh, somewhere around that time, between 2014, 15, and 2015, 16, uh, Delhi University started a new scheme which set aside 50% of the seats in master's courses for students of Delhi University itself who had done an honors undergraduate course in the same discipline. So for example, if I'm teaching in the de Department of Physics, then for MSc Physics, 50% of the seats of MSc Physics are reserved for those who have done BSc Honours Physics from Delhi University. Right? This is a straightforward quota. But uh, can you guess what this is called in the Delhi University system now? It's called the merit stream. It's no different from any other quota, but it's not called a quota. It's not called reservation. It's called merit stream. So and, uh, entrance into Delhi University, uh, admission into Delhi University is now through two, two streams. One stream is called the entrance stream, which is uh, the entrance test, presumably not a, a, a signifier of merit. Uh, and the other is this quota for Delhi University students. Unlike every other quota that has been made, every other type of reservation, including the EWS most recent, about which I'll say more, EWS reservation, uh, the Delhi University reservation does not signal disadvantage in any way. Clearly, the university cannot be expected to argue that being from Delhi University, having an undergraduate degree from Delhi University is a disadvantage in some way that needs to be compensated by reservation. That's not the argument. But uh, it's called the merit stream. It's not called. Uh, it's not called any kind of reservation. It's not called a quota. Uh, and uh, by the way, this has nothing to do with caste, because within the within the so-called uh, merit stream, that is within the Delhi University quota, there is reservation as as usual for for everything. So it's not really about caste. It's, I'm I'm just trying to illustrate to you what I mean when I say that reservation is an ideologically saturated thing because it did not occur to anybody to call this reservation. And even today, if you try to call it reservation, there is unease, there is resistance, uh, a position which is logically untenable, because this is no different from any, any, any quota, really, if you get down to it. But it is not called that. And not, not just any word, but the word merit is chosen to represent this stream. Right? This is what I'm talking about. Uh, we would never really, uh, you know, this is, there is no, nobody has had agitations on this issue. This was done very quietly. It was, you know, this, this move that suddenly 50% of the seats in the Delhi University MA courses were not available to uh, people who hadn't done an undergraduate degree in that discipline from Delhi University. 
uh, and let's take the EWS quota. Now, uh, there has been uh, my own, uh, I've written on this, uh, my own position is that the EWS, uh, if and when our jurisprudence, our legal system, our courts return to normal, uh, whenever that might be, we might expect some litigation on this. And I'm, uh, in the normal course of the events, in, in, the, in the India of uh, 10 years ago, uh, this would perhaps already have been struck down by the Supreme Court. Uh, and my opinion is based on the fact that the EWS quota um, does not invoke caste <clears throat> and at the same time excludes people from, who, are, um, who can claim other kinds of re uh, res reservation. Uh, this combination has been struck down in other contexts by the Supreme Court uh, earlier. So uh, the whole OBC, uh, the, what is called the Mandal case, uh, sort of revolved around this issue of uh, the type of backwardness and so on. Uh, and um, also the cases about whether uh, reserved category persons could be included in the so-called uh, unreserved uh, category and so on. So the EWS category, again, um, I'm sure there are no statistics on this, general statistics available as yet, but anecdotal evidence suggests that the cutoff for the EWS category is much lower than the cutoff for the so-called reserved categories. So for example, the bottom scheduled caste candidate in a particular course is likely to have scored much higher marks than the people who are getting in via EWS. Uh, it's a good thing, uh, don't get me wrong, it's a good thing that this has not brought the usual kind of censure and usual kind of uh, criticism. It's a good thing. but. I'm asking you to notice that this has not happened in the case of EWS, whereas it is routinely, it is a routine thing that is said about other quotas until, of course, evidence started to come in that there was no gap or the gap was very, uh, very uh, small. So this is another example of how reservation is an ideological thing that, um, that becomes uh, a part of everyday life that you take for granted and don't think about. So what I'm suggesting to you is that we need to explicitly target this kind of thing and make ourselves more self-conscious about how reservation is positioned, because that will in turn help us to deal with the um, invisible ways, with the, with the informal ways in which formal access is more or less nullified by informal modes of exclusion that operate within institutions, particularly elite institutions. Uh, and we can use the wedge that is opened up by something like EWS. We can use the change in attitudes that has been forced upon us since the 1990s to start talking about these things. But the larger question still remains. Higher education by itself cannot achieve anything until the larger economy has no jobs. It doesn't matter what your qualifications are. If there are no jobs, there are no jobs. So higher education will have no effect. In fact, it can stoke discontent when you have degrees that were supposed to get you jobs and uh, those jobs don't materialize. And we are seeing a lot of that uh, today. So uh, I'll, I'll stop here and um, uh, wait for uh, your uh, questions and criticisms and discussion and so on. So I'm saying that we have reached more or less the end of the road. There are still, uh, I'm not denying, there are still many specific problems to deal with, with the implementation of reservation. But by and large, crude or pure formal inclusion is a battle that has been won. But this means that a whole new battlefront has been opened up and has become more central, and that is the battlefront within elite institutions where uh, other forms of exclusion continue to operate. And how, how should we deal with those is what is, I think, one of the most important questions we are facing today. If higher education, especially elite higher education, is not to become a comorbidity of uh, caste inequality rather than a cure for it. Thank you.
thank you professor so now let's have the question session those who have questions please raise your hands in the uh, options and you can ask the questions i will call out the names yeah prakash you can ask thank you so much uh, husband uh, professor this was a brilliant topic thank you so much for sharing this uh, your thoughts uh, do you think uh, i have a very simple question uh, the higher education if you look at it primarily from an upper caste perspective a lot of upper caste are anyways going abroad for their higher education uh, and maybe they have less faith probably in the higher education uh, in india uh, is that the reason that um, uh, lower caste or let's say the reserved categories have more chance to gain their higher education in india because anyways most lot of upper caste i do not have of course the data to back it up but quite a lot of upper caste actually go abroad nowadays for their masters and so on uh, yes i will take questions one by one or should we collect wh what is your normal uh... so so you can uh, respond to this then we can take the oh. next question okay yes you're right that uh, but this going abroad thing is uh, a caste issue by accident so to speak that is to say the elite happen to be still are in our country uh, overwhelmingly upper caste and it is the it is the financial elite uh, who can go abroad and the financial elite happens to be upper caste uh there is no like causal role that caste plays in people going abroad and uh, a large number of upper castes cannot afford to go abroad so uh, the going abroad thing does not in a sense um, dissolve the caste question it remains uh, but yes for the elite increasingly for the elite um indian higher education is become apart from any anything else it's just too competitive uh many uh, people who can afford it um, can easily get into premier institutions abroad such as for example oxford university or cambridge university uh, and they cannot get into uh, you know an undergraduate course in an elite institution whatever is considered an elite institution uh, in in india now uh, a new thing that has happened is the emergence now of private universities um <coughs> <clears throat> and we have to see how that will change the change the see uh, scene uh, a new kind of university i'm saying private universities are quite old in india relatively old but a new kind has come up in the sense that they are also claiming to offer uh, liberal higher education of the same kind that uh, western institutions um, offer uh, obviously if you work it out in terms of um, exchange rates and so on it works out cheaper if if you get that kind of education in india so uh, they are relatively new so it's uh, uh, too early to um, talk about their impact uh, but this is what i have to say uh, yes it's true that the elite are going out but that's not really so much uh, a caste issue other than the fact that the composition of the elite happens to be upper caste thank you so much professor satish deshpande thank you very much So yes. here is a question in, in your chat box. Ah yes, uh, you said that the potential of reservations in terms of access has been reached, but in the massification stage, the growth in the number of private institutions, yes, uh, is much higher. Yes, uh, I should perhaps have gone and have gone into that. I've written about this, but um, yes, privatization is one of the ways in which massification has occurred. Uh, has occurred. Uh, you see there's a certain contradiction here we have said that we are in the era of neoliberal capitalism or we were until recently in the era of neoliberal capitalism where uh, the state was um, state support for social sectors was shrinking uh, and yet we have had a massification so clearly within that uh, privatization has had a big role to play uh, and by the way privatization has occurred not only in the private sector so to speak but also in the so called public sector large sections of public universities are now effectively privatized by being converted to 
uh, what is the phrase? I'm, I'm blocking the phrase. Um, uh, Self-supporting, self-financing courses. So, which means uh, public institutions are charging more or less private fees for courses. Increasingly, this is uh, this is happening. So yes, privatization is a major um, major factor here, but <coughs> its effect, its relationship to the to caste inequality in in particular, uh, is not necessarily as straightforward as one might assume, because uh, there is a, a large segment of of uh, non upper caste people as well uh, who access private institutions. I think. Uh, Socially speaking, uh, the most impact is by is is um, can be traced to uh, tier two and tier three private institutions. The best uh, or the highest tier private institutions um, operate in one way, but the tier two, tier three is where the action is in terms of how social inequalities are uh, being played out. Um, so. Yes, privatization is definitely very important. So there is a question in the chat box. I'll uh, read it. Uh, yeah. Do you think so PMRF is what again? Yeah, yeah. Is what is PMRF? Prime Minister's Research Fellowship. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, I don't know enough about this particular fellowship program. Uh, so if you could tell me what you, what you have in mind when you bring this up. Shubha, if you can clarify, please. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Okay, so uh, in the PMR of elig eligibility guidelines, it says that we have to be either pursuing uh, a degree in ISC, IITs, or NITs or ICER or IIESTs or we have to have a CGPA you know like a CGPA of 8 above or a, like very high gate score to apply for PMRF. So uh, this actually aims at students who have got into IITs you know at a very early age like uh, for their BTEC degree or something like that. So this kind of screens out the people who come to the uh, in, uh, to, who come to higher education later in their life, like uh, if they take a gap for working in between after their uh, undergraduate. So those people uh, lose out on such opportunities. So that's the reason I was asking. Okay, okay. I understand what you're saying. Yes. Uh, one thing you have to keep in mind uh, is that uh, it's quite all right for a state to have different kinds of fellowship schemes with different objectives. So uh, in principle, something like the PMRF, which is um, appears to be purely meritocratic and, and does not give any special uh, consideration for other um, things like caste or other forms of disadvantage, uh, it would be all right to have such a scheme depending on what else is happening in the fellowship space. So as long as there are a large number of fellowships which are designed to uh, address the problems of uh, seriously disadvantaged students, uh, whether disadvantaged by caste or disadvantaged in other ways and so on, uh, then it would be all right to have a scheme like this. Just a scheme uh, uh, like this alone, uh, just looking at this scheme alone, I think doesn't give us enough information to um, you know, take a stand on it. Uh, and I, I have to say that I don't really know much about this scheme yet, so I can't say more than that. But in general terms, that would be my view, that we need to understand where this falls in the larger uh, ecology of uh, ecosystem of fellowships and what is its uh, relative weight and so on. Uh, could you also discuss the implications the recently adopted NEP 2020 and the question of social justice? <laughs> yes, uh, the na new education policy 2020. Uh, I hesitate to <coughs> speak on the NEP policy, an uh, NEP document, because, uh, you know, I've been working on this. There have been uh, four different avatars of the NEP, this particular NEP. And I'm very wary of this particular one because, um, I mean, to exaggerate a little bit, 
every statement and its opposite can be found in the NEP. So it's a it's a very like slippery document, and uh, that is one thing. As a document itself, it is slippery. There are many passages in it that all of us would be full of praise for. In fact, I have myself been full of praise for at least the earlier avatar of it. Uh, a, a certain uh, certain things that were said there. For example, the earlier avatar said, one of the earlier avatars said that the system of ad hoc teachers will be ended immediately. Now, who could object to that? There are so many institutions with a major where the majority of teachers are permanently temporary. Now, clearly, that can't be good for an educational system. And if a, if a policy document says that, how could it be bad? But on the and in other places in the in the same document, uh, other measures are talked about that have exactly the opposite effect. So, as a document, it is all things to all people. So I am hesitant to say anything about it. The other point, of course, which has been brought home to us forcefully in the recent past, uh, is that there need be no co connection at all between a policy document and what the state does. And uh, this has often been true of higher education. So uh, I don't really know what to say about the NEP 2020. Uh, Next question. Kerala has implemented reservation for both uh, EVS and jobs and education, which has surprised many. Many people felt it was done in a hurry. Uh, are you surprised that a communist government is doing something like this? Uh, reservation has, as we all know, is a, not only ideologically saturated, but a deeply political issue. And um, it is one of those, those things, those measures that states find relatively easy to do. Uh, like, uh, for example, uh, introducing death penalty for some uh, like for rape or, you know, changing a law or something like that. Uh, that is easily done because that is in the control of the state, uh, whereas more difficult um, changes uh, for which a lot of groundwork has to be done are uh, less popular with governments and states. So uh, given that EWDS was brought by uh, a massively dominant political formation in the center, um, I am not, uh, I'm not surprised, uh, a little disappointed perhaps, but uh, not surprised because uh, the political pressure that this would have brought on, on um, state governments everywhere um, would be tremendous political pressure. So this is a, this is a pragmatic, uh, response. It's not really uh, sort of. It's not about principle and so on. So uh, the idea of the EWS um, itself, uh, I've written about separately. Um, there is no problem with uh, the state wanting to do something for economically underprivileged people. In fact, our entire development policy, after all, was poverty centric. And what is poverty if not a form of economic uh, disadvantage? Uh, the problem is when you bring the mechanism of reservation in particular to apply to bear on this issue, because uh, the problem of economic disadvantage can be dealt with in many ways other than the quota, whereas the, the problem of social exclusion, the only ultimately effective solution to it, because what we had because of caste in our society was forcible exclusion. Ultimately, the only answer to forcible exclusion is forcible inclusion. And reservation is forcible inclusion. So that is an answer to a specific question for which other answers don't work well. But the type of EWS reservation is the answer to a question where other answers could have worked as well or perhaps better. And um, that's my point about EWS, not that EWS itself as an idea or a principle is wrong, but that the form it takes by equating itself with other kinds of reservation that were designed to address intractable um, social prejudice uh, is, uh, is misplaced. And therefore, is in that form unconstitutional, in my opinion. Uh, implementation also an issue. Yes, yes, it is an issue. And uh, there are uh, <clears throat> the extent to which it is, it is an issue and its uh, significance uh, varies locally. And I'm quite willing to 
to, to concede that there can be situations where the implementation can be really, uh, really the main problem. But I'm speaking at the macro level. If you look at the overall picture, including for elite institutions, things have started moving inexorably. And there is now, as, as, as part of a of an administrative system of a, of a university, um, you feel that pressure now, which was not which was not felt before. Uh, the pressure to fill reservation seats and um, to uh, the, the the end of different ways in which uh, reservation was not really you know uh, was not a matter of concern uh, has is is no longer true. And at least from the from a formal legalistic point of view, uh, there is uh, interest is taken to ensure that uh, the the formal requirements are met. So that's my point, really. My point is that there isn't much more room there. Uh, we have to extend what has been happening. We have to extend what has been achieved, uh, and we have to complete the job in many cases where the implementation is still the issue. But uh, there's not much more scope as an initiative in terms of asking for reservation or in terms of reservation as a solution. What we have to focus on is other forms of exclusion post inclusion. Uh, that's what uh, and that's why uh, I'm particularly happy to speak to groups like in Tabar because uh, you are going to be groups like this uh, are going to be central in terms of dealing with these informal modes of exclusion. Uh, um, wait, I have to. While I agree there is direct stigma against the utterance of even the word reservation, and maybe that was one. This is uh, Damni Ken, uh, and maybe that was one of the many reasons. Uh, but I wanted to highlight one very recent. Uh, I don't understand why couldn't the SC students share the results? Uh, I, I'm assuming everyone can read this on the chat, so I'm not reading all of it out. Uh, I, I didn't fully understand what uh, is being said here. Yeah, Damini, could you please talk about this? <clears throat> Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. So I just wanted to highlight that while both uh, EWS as well as the SC, ST and OBC reservation are coming under the category of reservation, but there's a lot of stigma against the SC, ST, OBC reservation while EWS is being considered in university spaces as somewhat kind of deserving of reservation. So they, so it is very easier for them to even share result because they don't find that stigma in hiding the identity and all of that while whereas wow. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I agree entirely. That uh, Damni, you're making my point much better than I did. This is exactly <laughs> my point. Right? That uh, in unthinking ways we legitimize something and delegitimize something else, and that's what I think we should start forcing ourselves and therefore forcing those around us to become aware of. Uh, and uh, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, as I'm saying, uh, it's. It's a good thing if any form of affirmative action action on behalf of the underprivileged is not stigmatized. So I'm glad that the EWS is not stigmatized. I am pointing to the fact that similar kinds of action for others continues to be stigmatized. And, and we need to use these contrasts to, uh, to talk about it. And my point about EWS is that if economic disadvantage was the issue, then providing economic support would be the answer. That would seem to be the logical answer. Uh, and um, reservation seems to me to be wrong, a wrong step to take in this connection, the wrong form of redress um, for many reasons. Uh, deserving. Yes, yes, that's exactly the kind of thing. Uh, uh, also, the Delhi University uh, quota that I mentioned is uh, completely transparent in the sense that it is not visible to to people as, as, as a quota. Um, uh, the other point I wanted to make was that it would be interesting to look at the cutoffs for EWS compared to reserved categories. Does the lack of stigma survive 
a significant difference in cutoff would be an interesting question uh, to ask. And I invite you all to think about that in your own contexts. Uh, deserve new wedge between those who deserve reservation and those who don't uh, in universities. See, we are back to, uh, in a sense, uh, older ideas of uh, proper and improper, what is socially legitimate and what is socially illegitimate. For a long time, education itself was considered illegitimate, an illegitimate thing for lower castes to aspire to. Um, and uh, in, in, in the, this era is in living memory. It's not, uh, it's not, we are not talking about ancient history. Yeah. Uh, so the amount of work that has to be done to rescue this, uh, you know, this kind of, um, of uh, corrective action from the ideological scorn it is, it has, uh, it has been, it has been uh, drowning in, uh, is a lot of work has to be done. And all of us have to be, have to participate uh, in that work. Uh, softer exclusion is, uh, has, um, this is Neetu, uh, has very much relevance in the case of IITs. There's hardly any mechanism to support to ease the process. Yes, yes, I agree. And uh, this is what we need to take on. And this will not, this cannot be done through laws or rules or, uh, you know, informal ways. Uh, informal things need to be fought informally but, uh, through the same mechanisms. It's true that rules, <coughs> <clears throat> rules and laws provide support or provide an outside kind of frame. Um, and therefore, it's good that we have uh, rules that will, uh, you know, that you can be penalized if you are, uh, if you, um, you know, make fun of somebody, somebody's caste and so on. Uh, it's a good thing that we have laws like that. Uh, but those laws are not going to change attitudes in themselves. In fact, many times the, the laws bring out the worst in people. And they say that, uh, look at this, what is happening. And, uh, you know, it's one can't even call people by their caste names anymore. And what does the world come to and so on. Um, so yes, yes, this is what we need to, we need to fight. And uh, first of all, we need to fight it in ourselves uh, in, in, in the sense that there are so many um, attitudes that we are uh, un unknowingly condescending or unknowingly uh, looking down on um people for social reasons that is to say for no good reason uh, and 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 we need to think about that so there is a question you missed uh, oh, could you yeah. please talk a little bit more about the tied to institution and social inequality tied to institution as in colleges yes yes um, as you can imagine, in a, in a society as complicated as India, this insipid, broad term called mobility simply won't do. Because mobility means many, many different things, depending on the context. Uh, and climbing the social ladder, as it's called, it, the concrete meaning of this act varies a lot from context to context. And what I'm trying to say is that we, for an institution like caste, we have to pay attention to relative distance. Always relative distance is, is, is important. So what are the dominant castes? I, I use the dominant caste term in a generic sense. I don't mean specific castes that have been called dominant caste, but castes that are dominant. Uh, what is their educational profile and what begins to happen or when uh, this profile is challenged by uh, lower caste? The initial uh, 1980s uh, cases of atrocities were often related to uh, these perceived uh, shrinking of the social gap, particularly in educational terms. Uh, so, um, Chunduru, for example, a uh, famous case from uh, Andhra Pradesh, uh, several cases from Maharashtra uh, are uh, 
targeted particularly uh, educated dalit youth or sometimes adivasi youth uh, because of the feeling that the relative distance was uh, shortened so i'm saying that uh, when it comes to <coughs> when it comes to tier 1 institutions it is the elite of every group who are involved right so uh, talk about uh, let's take um, all india institute of medical sciences now for even for the reserved categories who among the scheduled castes or who among the scheduled tribes are going to be in serious competition for places in a place like uh, aims or iits it's going to be the elite of that community right so the reason why i'm talking about tier 2 uh, and the fact of there being elite in some sense changes the equations it doesn't make caste go away uh, don't get me wrong it doesn't make caste go away as we know too well uh, but uh, it does um, in a sense change the nature of the problem uh, which is very different in tier 2 and tier 3 uh, institutions which are uh, more sort of uh, you know rough and tough you know where uh, a, lo a lot more is happening by way of exerting of social pressure and i feel that this is an intuitive thing and um, i only have anecdotal evidence for this but i feel that this would be a much better site to observe and to research if you are interested in differential uh, mobilities and uh, caste and the role of higher education i think it is these tier 2 tier 3 institutions which will be uh, where a lot of movement will be happening in caste terms uh, and causing a lot of friction and so on and this is just a guess so far uh, and, and i'm just offering it to you as a as a suggestion um i've lost my place here in the chat is there anything else here that i'm yeah. yeah so there is a question uh, the softer form of exclusion which you were referring to has very much relevance in the case of iits there is hardly any mechanism to support or to ease the process many have quit from the program due to this mainly research could you please express your take on this forced quitting so the question is about forced quitting <clears throat> yes yes uh, this is a very painful issue and a very real issue um and uh, there have been different kinds of efforts to address this uh, the most effective in my opinion have been student based efforts uh, efforts that come from student groups themselves and um, i see student groups as uh, the front line in this kind of uh, in this kind of fight um and it is a fight let's uh, let's not have any doubt about it uh, it is a fight and um uh, it has to be fought and uh, i think uh, groups of this sort need to be formed and need to be encouraged and supported wherever they are um and <clears throat> uh, and uh, as a, but as i keep saying the starting point always has to be uh, yourself Uh, especially if you happen to be uh, an upper caste person uh, because the ways in which caste uh, as we say makes its home in us is uh, is very very subtle and uh, with the best of intentions often we are only enacting a a script already written for us by our caste and we don't uh, we don't realize it and i think the our first task is to make ourselves aware of it in ourselves uh, so that um, we deal with it as a genuine issue a genuine problem uh, not as a form of generosity on our part or altruism on our part that we are uh, you know it's so it's so good of us good of me to be concerned about um people with whom i don't actually share a condition um we have to get out of that uh, out of that frame and realize that you're addressing a shortcoming or a fault or a deficit in yourself not in somebody else and that change of attitude is not an easy one and one has to work hard to achieve it for oneself and make it easier for others to achieve it as well so i have a question yes so yeah 
The year of privatization of higher education coincided largely with the extension of reservation to central elite institutions such as IITs. At a time when the opportunities available in public educational institutions are itself shrinking, what implication do such decisions have? Are there any ideological considerations behind such decisions? <coughs> yes. Um, this brings us back to the old issue of the larger economic system that not just higher education, but our entire economy, and not just our economy, but the world economy today is part of. Uh, and to some extent, this is a problem that, that can only be solved at all levels at once. Uh, and the local localized solutions for it are very, very difficult, as, as experience shows us. So to some extent, um, uh, to some extent, uh, states, it, it's beyond state control. The shrinking of funds is because uh, states are themselves uh, gripped into, in, within a larger um, framework where they're, they're, they have very little room for maneuver. Uh, but aside from that, yes, there are many other things that the state can do to release funds, and uh, those things are not done. And occasionally, we have examples like in the first term of the AAP government in Delhi. Uh, suddenly, the education budget, this was mainly schools, it wasn't higher education. The education budget could be increased substantially uh, because the AAP government had decided to do so. So there is a lot of room to improve things within the system that is not taken because uh, there are uh, other pressures, other political pressures. So the pressure to uh, keep public fund, uh, public uh, education alive, public higher education alive, that pressure needs to be maintained, especially now. Um, but uh, remember that there is a constituency for privatization, even within the so-called lower castes, that there is a lower caste elite, which uh, is looking, you know, which is behaving in many ways, not very differently from upper caste elites in seeking uh, particular kinds of credentialing um, and is therefore uh, willing to go the private route. This is a this is a difficult issue that cannot be avoided anymore. That is internal inequalities. Uh, now, routinely, internal inequalities in disadvantaged groups are brought up in order to discredit the very idea of disadvantage itself, right? The anecdotal story, you will always hear stories about everyone, it seems, knew a very rich OBC or a very rich uh, uh, scheduled caste person or scheduled tribe person uh, who was uh, no good at studies, but just because they were, uh, you know, uh, rich and um, they had reservation, they could do things that um, the, the uh, proverbially poor upper caste student uh, couldn't and so on. Um, but it's it's uh, beyond that, it is true that there is now every single group uh, has very deep internal inequalities, which are beginning to be addressed as well. It's no longer possible to sweep it under the carpet. So most major um, lower caste groups have a sharp divide between one or two um, castes which have cornered the benefits of reservation and the others in that group are still far behind. Part of this reason is demographic, but part of it is also uh, dominance and, and the same reasons why upper castes have dominated. So this is an issue that is beginning to be taken up. It's a difficult issue to take up and um, many kinds of accidents and uh, wrong turnings are possible, but it needs to be taken up. There's another question here. Representation of the socially marginalized section at the level of teaching is more striking. Yes, yes. I didn't show you the teacher's data. Uh, not surprisingly, the diversification of the teacher's uh, pool or the body of teachers lags behind the diversification of students. Uh, but lately, it has been picking up. Uh, yes, uh, I don't know if you're aware of it. There is a there is a struggle going on in the IIMs, which are now autonomous, 
um, in, in a way that they were not before uh, and uh, have hardly any um, non-upper caste uh, teachers. Uh, so they have uh, refused to answer RTIs, they have refused to implement reservation and uh, there is a some some faculty members are uh, fighting this. <clears throat> And there is a professor at um, IM Bangalore who has written extensively on this. You can search Deepak Malghan. Uh, he has written on this and is uh, part of many such efforts to diversify faculty in elite institutions. Uh, but slowly it's happening. Composition is beginning to change. Um, higher education is a relatively complex field because with with uh, if you if you are principled about it you cannot simply argue for access you have to also in a sense work towards maintaining quality along with access so which means a lot more work has to be done by people in institutions particularly teachers and by fellow students and so on to make up for the accumulated deficit in prior in the upstream education that people come to higher education with an accumulated disadvantages, uh, purely educational disadvantages by virtue of their uh, socioeconomic identity, which includes caste and where caste is a major part of it. So uh, compensating for that for the absence of that uh, kind of social training to participate in higher education, um, that has to be undertaken also uh, informally. And that's part of the effort I was talking about that needs to be made. Uh, but it, the best, most effective um, mode of, of doing this is through um, teachers have their own groups for teachers, um, students have their own groups for students and so on. We need to do a lot more of this than uh, is currently happening. And yes, I agree that uh, the question of uh, diversification of teachers is critical and is lagging at the moment. But the good thing is that uh, it is beginning to change in most institutions. There are very, very few islands where um, this is still being explicitly like blocked. Yes, uh, like, yeah. So when we look at the PhD admission in IITs and the data shows that the under-representation of students from SCST and OPC communities for PhDs. So uh, the amendment, recent amendment to the CAA Act also for the faculty recruitment from these communities. So uh, when we look at there won't be enough applicants from these communities who have completed a PhD from IIT or IAS or these elite science in institute or universities so what do you think about a possibility of uh, empowering them through pre-doctoral fellowship or pre-doctoral program to equip themselves to get more representation in the research yes i feel this is the this is the difficult part i mean this is the the difficult part about higher education there is no point providing access to higher education if you don't provide full participation and full participation in higher education requires you to be trained at a particular level. And if that training is absent or is lacking, then something has to be done to make that up. And uh, that is absolutely that needs to be uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, and what uh, institutions need to be held accountable for is not how many seats they filled specifically. But over a reasonable period of time, let's say five years or 10 years, what have you achieved with the students that you got, research students that you got from these categories and whom you yourself trained? Why were you not able to train them enough to be able to compete for jobs in this space? Is the question, is the legitimate question to be asked, I think. And for higher education, particularly for PhD, uh, I, I personally do not feel there should be a fixed number of seats and it should it should uh, they should be filled regardless and so on. Uh, I know that different methods of pressure have to be used in order to 
push systems that are reluctant to do something, uh, to push them to do these things. But um, I feel that effort is needed in terms of a, a genuine accountability of institutions over a period of time. What is it that you have done with the students that you yourself got and you yourself trained? Because after all, where do the where is the supply pool for higher education coming from? It's coming from higher education itself, right? So higher educational institutions should be held responsible for this at the PhD level. At other levels, yes. Lower levels, yes, there should be. Uh, and there is, as there already is, uh, a system of filling up seats and, uh, and so on. But here, um, I think care should be taken that um, training does not become, does not suffer, and that uh, institutions are held accountable in a, in a reasonable yet very firm way to, the, to what they have done with the input they have got in terms of these students. <clears throat> Uh, I am institutions like I am cater to themselves. I recruiting teachers. Yes, exactly. That's the point I was making just now, and that's the point Deepak makes also. That um, it's okay for you to say that uh, only IITs or IIMs, etc., have the requisite standards. But you had these students as well. So what happened to your students? Uh, you know. So uh, we are we have been used in higher education to always blame upstream levels of education for problems. Now, it's too late in the day to keep on doing that. I think we have to recognize those as a fact of life and start to work uh, towards addressing that. Um, so for example, we are starting uh, in my department, we have started from last year, a course on academic reading and writing that is taught to the first semester entrance. Um, something that we used to take for granted before that everybody knows how to read and write academically. But these are the sorts of things that will now have to be taught because we have a very diverse student body. Um, so measures like this is only one example, and it's uh, inadequate in itself. A lot more needs to be done. Uh, but this is the kind of thing that needs to be done to ensure that um, the experience of, of new entrants is, is a full experience and that they therefore derive um, derive full benefit from the uh, from that experience, and in turn, therefore, are able to um, able to perform at the levels that these institutions demand. And the excuse that uh, there are not um, enough qualified candidates uh, should over time become become impossible to to produce to to give. Uh, students from different categories who oppose reservations. Yes, uh, yes, that 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 happens. But um, you know, you have to explain why what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for others. Uh, it's very difficult for most people to separate themselves as an individual from the social group to which they belong. And when the characteristics of the social group are being talked about. It's natural for people to feel addressed or interpolated individually. Uh, we have to try and find resources to help people to get over that individual sense. So a uh, common thing, of course, is um, Brahminism, for example. Just to, so just because I'm a Brahmin, uh, I need not get all hot and bothered about critiques of Brahminism um, because I should objectively be able to recognize that what is true of the social group to which I was born into by accident of birth, uh, those are objective truths and they need to be addressed. They need not uh, say that I am individually, personally a bad person. Right? One needs to be able to make this distinction. And uh, this is hard to make. Experientially, this is hard to make, especially for young people. Uh, who are uh, living very uh, crowded, very stressful lives when so much in their life is dynamic, is moving in this period when you're in educational institutions. Um, <clears throat> so I, I recognize that it's not easy. It's easy for me to say it, but uh, it's very hard to you know, sort of bring it into your own experience. 
but that is where that is the direction that is the goal that we have to strive for both individually and as members of larger formal or informal groups that are working towards these objectives so any more questions so i think the questions are over so okay we can yeah so thank you so much yeah it was yeah. Uh, there were lots of questions and uh, i'm sure i haven't really addressed them in full but um, this will be an ongoing conversation so you're welcome to uh, email me <coughs> if you have yeah. further questions and so on and uh, thank you for this opportunity and yeah. um, it's it's yeah. uh, it's a long road ahead and uh, you know all of us have to do our best yeah so thank you sir thank you for your insightful talk so our next program will be on 11th of december evening 5:30 on gender question in science education and the such it's a panel discussion with dr prajwal shastri and vinida bal also uh, the participants who are interested in engaging with the process of diversification in iits please fill the google doc document link shared in the chat box by chindaba so once again i thank thank you all the participants and the professor for this wonderful session thank you sir thank you all and thank you for there are many wonderful comments that i've i've not been able to re respond to all of them so let me collectively thank all of you for responding and for your Uh, good wishes and so on but uh, we are all part of this larger uh, struggle which which we have to participate in as best as we can thank you uh, thank you sir thank you thank you sir thank you all i I'll, uh, i'll be leaving now so you can always email me later in case there's anything Yes, sir. Sure. sure.